Hi, this is Phil Simon, and you're listening to Two Guys Talking Rush. Two guys, two guys are talking, rush two, 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 two guys, two guys are talking, rush two, two guys are talking, rush two, two guys, two guys are talking, rush, 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 two guys. And now, get ready for the Two Guys Talking Rush podcast with your hosts, John Kane and Dan Buxman. Hey folks, my name's John Kane and this is the delightful Dan Buxman and welcome to episode 39 of the Two Guys Talking Rush podcast. This is not Two Guys Talking Pat Boone. It is not. (laughs) Absolutely not. It's two guys talking the incredibly iconic Rush. So listen in, folks, and discover the best damn Rush podcast in the entire Solar Federation. Two guys talking Rush. Dan. Right on. What's happening? Not too much. Just enjoying some coffee on this lovely afternoon. It is. It's It's been a very cool spring. Uh, It was unbearably hot on Sunday here, Mm -hmm. but uh, I am a, a sweaty overweight person so just heat generally disagrees with me so you know <laughs> oh i love that mix um, it's a good mix yeah, yeah and absolutely no no nothing against pat boone who actually put out a, a metal album at one point didn't he uh what was it that it's the i would loosely file it under under metal it's uh have you heard it I forget about it. <laughs> I, I need to go. Re- I need to revisit it. I you heard a really, tracks from it. You really don't. You really don't yeah. need to revisit it at all. Actually, yeah, yeah. you'll, you'll that, be okay if you don't. It's yeah. that bad, huh? Uh, it, it's uh, the cover is funny, yeah. but like venturing in beyond the cover is not really necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah too funny. Well, here we are uh, at another episode, uh, kind of closing in on uh, episode forty, which is really amazing and. Uh, I don't know who who ever thought we'd make it this far, but here we are. Keep it. We just keep on trucking. What can I say? Keep truck. Keep on trucking and keep on trying. That's what Mm -hmm. we do Mm -hmm. here at Two Guys Talking Rush. Well, Dan, may the fourth be with you. Yes, exactly. Are you are you one of those people? A Star Wars fan? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. I am an original Star Wars fan. I went to see Star Wars at the movie theater. That's how old I am. Uh, Of course, uh, Empire Strikes Back, which is my favorite. And then uh, Return of the Jedi, uh, Mm -hmm. all in that sequence. And um, I'm not really a fan of the, 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 the George Lucas, the pre was it the prequels uh, yes. that he put out? Uh, I wasn't a real fan of those. I did revisit those recently, and um, eh, they don't, they don't. They're just still, bad. they're still terrible. They are terrible. Say, yeah. It's bad yeah. casting yeah. and a lot of confusion yeah. and uh, mm-hmm. so maybe some stereotypical uh, 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 characterizations of of aliens and, and things yeah. like that. It's not, not great. Not nah, great. Nah, yeah. nah. Um, but anyway, um, I was thinking like, wow, you know, hey, Rush in Star Wars, and I saw a meme, of course, uh, from the the body lyrics from the body electric and it was of c3po and r2d2 and um a little backstory on that uh song uh of course off of grace under pressure released uh, april 12th 1984 uh almost near uh, the anniversary of that album uh, your the, your favorite rush album of it, all, it is right? it yeah. is grace under pressure is my favorite rush album uh mm-hmm. and um it's it's probably it doesn't come up a lot as a favorite for people. And I, I guess I'm going back to my early days of listening to Rush. Thank God. I don't want, I don't want to be part of the same pool. <laughs> I don't want to be swimming in the same pool as a bunch of other people. I want to be I alone in the pool, you know? So I'm, in the, oh, yeah. I'm alone in the pool of uh, Grace Under Pressure. But yeah, I think that album just, I love the, 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 the song structures. I love the, it has, to me, it has that uh, combination of huge, a big, the big Rush sound, 
but mm-hmm. also encompassing the big keyboard sound, the big electric sound. And of course the lyrics are futuristic and boom, it's, it's my, it's Rush's science, science, scientific album. You know, it's science I, album. I think it's a great science record. It There's is a great ev- record. every reason for it to be your favorite for yeah. sure. Um, yeah. I, it, maybe it's, uh, I think it's viewed as like sort of a transitional album. It totally is. Yeah. Which is maybe why, you know, everyone doesn't say like, that's my favorite. Cause you right. know, it's, that's the only one where they use that producer um and it's it's really its own little thing right uh so you know it's kind of unique in the entire ca- you know in the entire catalog but i think i love it i think it's great, it's uh, great i it's also great. think it's a doom metal album but nobody agrees with me. <laughs> it could be i guess those songs could be equated into uh into metal tunes very easily you know they're heavy yeah, like very heavy like emotionally and lyrically love it's it. it's one of their lyrically i would say one of their heaviest albums it has sort of the, the the way the songs move and punctuate has there's a little bit of witch hunt in them too yes. you know yeah mm-hmm. um, well the body electric uh, it released strangely enough after doing some digging in may of 1984 and here we are it's oh, may 4th there we go uh, the body electric it's the fifth song off of grace under pressure released in 84 performed live on the grace under pressure warm up tour grace under pressure tour power winders warm up tour and recently uh, was performed on the uh, Clockwork Angels tour. Some believe the song was inspired by the movie THX 1138, one of the first films made by Star Wars creator George Lucas. And if we remember those those opening sequences of Star Wars, one human, and as the lyrics go, one humanoid escapee, Mm -hmm. one android on the run, seeking freedom beneath the lonely desert sun, trying to change its program, trying to change the mode, crack the code, images conflicting and data and data overload. So I think there's a lot of, there's a little, some tie-ins there. Maybe, there, maybe, I don't think I'm pushing it too far, but uh, geez. No, there's, there's some overlap for sure. Yeah. If you played absolutely. those lyrics over that desert scene on Tatooine with uh, C-3PO and R2-D2 walking under yeah. the, Lonely Desert Sun. Uh, it would make a lot of sense. Um, also, some believe it's based on Twilight Zone episode 100, I Sing the Body Electric. The episode originally aired in 62. It's about a family who orders a robot grandmother after the death of their young mother. Written by Ray Bradbury, the name came from a Walt Whitman poem. The story was later included in a short in short stories collection with the same title in 1969. Uh, the Body Electric uh, features a guitar solo with an ad- added harmonizing effect with a delay, which uh, Lifeson has described as pretty bizarre. And it is sort of a bizarre song. Yeah, yeah I mean, when you, when you hear it, like just listening to it, it doesn't seem that out there to me. But you know, when I think about it, when you think of the individual components, it's like, oh, huh, yeah, that is a little out there. Yeah totally it's but it works of, perfectly yeah, so it does yeah. and grace under pressure is sort of an out there album for rush i yeah. remember that it wasn't uh widely accepted when it first came out it was a hard one t- for people to absorb uh that, uh i liked it the second i heard it yeah. uh and i you know i remember i loved the distant early warning video mm-hmm. uh every, everything about Anatomy it was within, great. yeah I think the body electric is one of uh, Neil Peart's best drum performances oh, on a studio. I mean, oh, good. it's great. And good. we encourage all fans to spend a little more time with that record. Yeah. It deserves it. it give it a hug. It's not nice. definitely. definitely. Yeah. Well, may the fourth be with you, Dan. Thank you very much. Are you a star Wars fan as well? Yeah. To the yeah. point where it's like annoying and a problem for the people who have to be around me. Wow. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So, are you doing anything special to? Uh, well, you are dressed as a Jedi right now. I am dressed uh, as a the... Jedi. Uh, no, what my uh, Star Wars fandom manifests itself mostly in uh, complaints about stupid things on internet discussion boards. Okay, I'm that kind of fan. Yeah. <laughs> Too funny. What did you think of the later J.J. Uh, Abramson uh, treatments? Um, what I thought was that the Disney Star Wars movies, yeah. uh, I thought Rogue One. Oh, that was awesome. Was like quite possibly the best Star Wars movie they ever made. Uh, wow. There were, in fact, times I thought it was too good for Star Wars. It was really good. Uh, I liked The Last Jedi very much, which 
is not a popular opinion uh i don't, I don't know i mean the, the the new trilogy like episode seven eight nine i just i felt like it was just kind of forgettable mm-hmm. uh but i liked the side movies that they did like i liked rogue one i liked solo i like oh you liked doing. solo i did like solo yeah oh wow yeah, yeah i couldn't get through it uh a lot of people couldn't get through it yeah, uh, yeah. most people couldn't get through it in fact yeah, yeah. uh but uh, yeah i enjoy i and i like uh the mandalorian i, I like mandalorian. i like the stuff that they're doing that's kind of around the episode four five six period yeah that's what i'm interested in and the prequels were horrible and unwatchable yeah and the sequels were just not that great yeah so yeah, I guess we're you and I are both like just kind of original trilogy and original trilogy adjacent guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, we're really geeking out now. Star we really Wars are. and like, Rush. Holy pretty hard. Yeah, let's get to Rush and stop <laughs> geeking out. <laughs> well, remember, folks, this show is hosted by fans for fans, and our listeners know we are inclusive. Each week, we try to mix it up with guests and content, and we want our fans to join us on this magnificent journey. Uh, before I forget, I wanted to thank our guests on episodes. 37 and 38 the incredible rush tribute project a big thank you yes yes man that was those that if you if hopefully uh if you're listening now go back and listen to those episodes they put on a a live performance for us that was uh uh interstellar it was it was it was so it took us on a little journey and they they played their asses off as far as i'm concerned that's how i would describe it they played their asses off they sure did yeah Uh, so we want to thank bill heck sean jones and tom slonick for uh, putting in the effort uh, to uh, be interviewed and uh, perform for us and for our fans on Two Guys Talking Rush. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Um, well, here at uh, Two Guys Talking Rush, we're fans of the talented crews who make up the live event and touring industry, which seems to be bouncing back a little bit. I'm seeing tour dates for Primus. I'm seeing tour dates for who's putting on a special Rush performance, tour dates for the Flaming Lips and and other bands. So, uh, you know, sticks. let's keep sticks. Yep, yep, definitely. So please support the Sweet Relief Musicians Fund at sweetrelief.org. A small donation will help the thousands of music industry people who have been out of work and affected by COVID-19. Uh, there's still a lot of work. It hasn't fully recovered yet. So uh, this Sweet Relief Musicians Fund provides financial assistance to all types of career musicians, music industry workers uh, who are struggling to make ends meet uh, during this t- these tough times. Uh, I'm, I can't wait to go back to a show. So uh, please support support where you can. May, it may happen soon it's looking like so I'm, i know i'm pleased about that i'm half vaxxed so i can't wait to be fully vaxxed I, oh. I got the i got the pfizer and uh um i had no no issues with it at all i got the pfizer also uh, yeah. my wife got the moderna and it knocked her flat on her ass for a really? full day uh so if you know to the audience out there if you're planning on getting vaccinated when they bring you the wine list yeah choose the pfizer that's that's what we yeah, recommend right, right, right. two guys talking rush. i mean i had one small side effect i couldn't i couldn't feel my lips so every time i drank water it just poured down my the front of my shirt that was your drinking problem yeah so i yeah. That was my drinking problem just joking <laughs> i didn't have any issue. i, know, I just yeah. had a lot of wet shirts um anyway uh as a reminder you can hear our podcast on tune in apple podcast spotify pandora simplecast and others the show is recorded uh, in video so please check out our youtube channel and click subscribe it seems as though we're getting more and more subscribers you could check us out what we're wearing you know what we look like and then you know never listen to us again yeah, uh, right. <laughs> unshaven oh, middle-aged uh, rush yeah. fans talking about star wars yeah. uh, a quick uh, rush radio shout out uh, you can find rush radio on the tune in app and rushradio.org a big thank you to ed stenger at rushesaband.com we love rush as a band as well as the power windows website 2112 check them out folks uh, great people. Another quick shout out to the mighty Why Why Not. Their music can be heard in the show's intro. An incredible band, of course. And Rush fans, we want to hear from you. If you have comments, suggestions, ideas, questions about the show, please submit. Uh, we'd like to hear from you. Email us at two guys talking rush at gmail. That's two T W O, not the number two. Two guys talking rush at gmail. We're always looking for super fans. Uh, for our Rush Superfan Spotlight. Uh, what is a superfan? What makes you a superfan? Tell us. Email us and tell us why you should be on Two Guys Talking Rush. And you can also visit us, visit us at our website, twoguystalkingrush.com, our Facebook page, facebook.com, Two Guys Talking Rush, Twitter, that's twitter.com slash the number two uh, guys talk rush. And again, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to our Two Guys Talking Rush 
YouTube channel. Um, we also have uh, uh, wonderful uh, kitschy items like coffee mugs, t-shirts, buttons, stickers, and other cool stuff on two guys talking rush.com. And if you want to support the podcast, please try uh, every little bit counts to keep it going uh, at www.patreon.com slash two guys talking rush patreon patreon however you want to say it well we have an email from a fan we usually get emails we've been getting close to a, an email per week or a couple per week so shall i read yes please okay so here it is hey john and dan i can't stop listening to you guys i appreciate what you do i have loved rush since 1982 i am now 51 years old thanks to my cousin steve for turning me on right on steve I tried listening to other I tried listening to the other podcasts slash fan cast, but they put me to sleep. Dry, homogenized, safe humor with absolutely no B asterisk L L S whatsoever. Got it. You guys also have much better guests, and I appreciate the looseness and uniqueness of your show. Sure they know Rush, but you guys are doing something special here. Keep up the great work. You both put a smile on my face every episode in the long run. It's all about Rush anyway. Thanks, Tim from Delaware. Ah, Tim. Tim, seriously. Yeah, that is kind. That's, yeah. Wicked, that's wicked right. kind. And you know something when it comes down to it? You know, we're just, you know, with regard to other podcasts, we're all in the same boat together doing yeah. the same wonderful things. And you know, at least <clears throat> for those who want to listen to us or listen to anybody else, it's an acquired taste. Uh, you right. know, like folks might not like our style and they may like uh, the other uh, um, uh, cast style, and, and that's the great thing about freedom of choice, right? Yeah, being able to choose. Should we be calling them the leading podcast? Like, well, you know, like we're a competing brand or like a I, Tide I, versus the leading I don't know. detergent? I don't know. You know what? I don't know what their stats are. They definitely have more, they've been around longer, so they yeah. have more casts. Yeah. I think we're doing something a little different, and I think we're also our podcast is filling in a void that the other podcast wasn't covering. I mean, I think we're much more of a fuller show uh, mm -hmm. with regard, and we have a lot, we have a different personality style, you and I, so. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I mean, I, I absolutely respect those guys and I respect what they do. And they, yeah, they were here. here, they were here before we were. And uh, I, I'm happy that like what we do does not step on their toes. Like they have their thing, that's what they do, that's cool. Yeah. We have our thing. Yeah. Plenty I'm of room a, you to know, coexist. I've only listened to a couple episodes and they have a style that's yeah. very particular to them. And I think we, we just bring a whole new sort of, um, I don't know. Middle-aged, unshaven vibe. <laughs> yeah. we're, and like like Tim from Delaware says, we're a lot looser. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have a different type of sense of humor. So uh, yeah. anyway, the best of luck to everybody. Uh, and I hope, hopefully another podcast pops out. It's, it's the rush pie is, is, hell, is large. So yeah. we can all sort of join in. And... Eaten by all. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, thanks, Tim. And uh, as you know, we sort of cover uh, Rush tour dates, uh, history. Uh, this is uh, May 4th, 2021. Um, 1969, shortly, shortly after being fired from Rush, Getty Lee had to fo forego seeing the Jimi Hendrix Experience concert so he could go to the newly renamed Hadrian Show at the Coffin and help Lindy Young out with the words. Interesting. Yeah. In 73, Rush play the Colonial Tavern in Toronto. Uh, in 70, uh, 74, they also play the Colonial Tavern in Toronto. In 75, they play the Channel High School in Bedford, Ohio on the Fly By Night Tour. In 77, they play the Music Hall in Omaha, Nebraska on the All the Worlds of Stage Tour. In 1979, they play the first of four nights at the Hammersmith Odeon in London on the Hemispheres tour. This, this is a, these are some famous shows. All four shows were recorded and filmed for a live album and feature film tentatively named Live in England, which was later shelved. Interesting. Hmm. Hmm, I'd like to, that'll probably come out sometime. Yeah. Uh, in 83, they play the Ahoy Sports Palace in uh, Rotterdam, Rotterdam, Holland on the Signals tour. And uh, 88, they play the Fest Hall in Frankfurt, Germany on the Hold Your Fire Tour. In 1990, they play the Coliseum in Richmond, Virginia on the Presto Tour. In 92, they play the Ahoy Sports Palace in Rotterdam again on the Rolling yep. Bones Tour. In 94, they play the Knickerbocker Arena in Albany, New York on the Counterparts Tour. In 94, they play the War Memorial in Rochester, New York on the Counterparts Tour. 1999, La Villa, the Strangiato, performed by Greg Howe, was released on Ascend. 
in 2004, Chronicles, the DVD collection, was released in the UK and Europe. I like Chronicles. I, I have that. It's, it's a good it's collection. A good, yeah, it's a good collection. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, we could be like, well, this song's not on it. And this, sure. it, but it works overall. And uh, you're never going to get every song on there that everyone wants. Exactly. But exactly. it's a, yeah, it's a good selection. In 2005, Limelight, performed by Spearfish, was released on Area 605. In 2007, Working Man was heard during today's episode of My Name is Earl. Remember that show, My Name yes. is Earl? Yes, I did. Yes. <laughs> that was a funny show. It was a funny show. Yeah. Uh, 2000, what was the actor's name? He was in uh, Almost Famous. Uh, Jason Lee? Yeah, Jason Lee. Was yeah, it Jason? Yeah. 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 yeah, he worked with Kevin Smith, right? Right, yeah. Also, yeah, yeah. Was he in Clerks? Yeah, he was in Clerks. I don't remember. I know he was in Chasing oh, Amy. Oh, Chasing Amy. That was yeah, it. Yeah, right, Chasing yeah. Amy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In 2008, uh, Rush play the Reno Events Center in Reno, Nevada on the Snakes and Arrows Tour. 2008, they play the Sleep Train Pavilion in Concord, California on the Snakes and Arrows Tour. In 2011, they play the Hartwall Arena in Hel Helsinki, Finland on the Time Machine Tour. In 2013, they play the PNC Arena in Raleigh, North Carolina on the Clockwork Angels Tour. Well, uh, you know, Rush are just a busy band. I mean, this is yeah. just incredible stuff. And it's equatable to the Grateful Dead and just touring, touring, touring. I mean, you know, isn't like Bob Weir, the uh, the most played musician. He's just been, he's played the most, I think I think that's his claim to fame at this point. Uh, I, I would believe that. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely believable. Yeah, like if you yeah. just counted all the shows he's played live, I mean, he's just been thousands, right? Well, yeah, and uh, if you want to like count all the people who followed him yeah. to each one of those shows, too, you know. Are you a Grateful has... Dead fan? I am not, oh, uh, okay. but I'm not a hater. Yeah, and I have immense respect for them yeah. and for every. You know, I mean, they're comparable to me only to Rush mm -hmm. in terms of you know the type of audience they have, the devotion sure. of the audience. That you know, I mean, I can't name another band that caused millions of people to just drop out of life and follow them and yeah. like make lanyards to trade to stay alive you know that's like yeah, the grateful dead are a phenomenon you know i i actually grew to like the i had so many chances to see them and i was such a metal snob yeah uh, listening to fate's warning and uh, walking by all these hippies in front of the right. boston garden all angry but um yeah i grew i grew to like the uh <laughs> the music of the grateful dead and they have it they certainly have they certain they capture this time and this essence of, of, um, of uh, situational. Yeah. Um, um, I don't know when you, if you're out and you're at a festival or, if you're, or it's a summertime and you're in a lounge chair and you're having a cold one and doing whatever you do and the Grateful Dead's on the background, it, it sort of creates a vibe, you know, and I, I like that. Yeah, and I mean it's it's really not comparable to anything you know when we did the woodstock thing yeah uh i was staying on the i was staying on the gasker farm grounds and yes. all that sort of, you know and it's like there's this music playing everywhere everyone is high you know smoking this right. like we weapons grade marijuana right and it's like you know the grateful dead have a lot to do with this you know the fact right. that it that it is what it is yeah uh they really deserve a ton of credit i think just for like festival culture and yeah. the idea of like just going from city to city following festivals is like you know i don't know if that would exist without them it's so true so, yeah respect That's a really great way of putting it well um anyway rush uh, this week uh, rush in the news um alternative universe rush featured in part eight of judge dread comic metropolis so metropolis uh, megatropolis uh, is a comic from kenneth neiman judge dread and Dave Taylor, Judge Dredd and Batman, which reimagines re the world of Judge Dredd and the iconic, iconic Mega City One as an Art Deco retro futured variation. Huh. The, eighth, the eighth and final part of the comic appears in the latest Judge Dredd magazine, number 431, which just came out. Although not explicitly named, what appears to be an alternative universe version of Rush appears in one of the comics preview panes shown online. Uh, you can see it on uh, Instagram. The preview pain shows dread vigilante crashing onto the stage of the megatropolis mayoral charity ball where a band unmistakably rush is playing <laughs> wow the, the entire eight-part megatropolis series will be made available as a hardcover book uh coming in october you can pre-order it and uh that sounds really cool 
Oh, wow. That's, yeah, that's funny. I didn't even know that was happening. Oh, Russia just kind of like just penetrating all. all they are everywhere. Like, I know. It's crazy. Um, Russia's Moving Pictures album is now certified five times platinum by the RIAA. Mm -hmm. uh, on the 19th of April, the RIAA awarded Russia's Moving Pictures album five times multi-platinum status, meaning five million units yep. have been sold to date. Wow, that's a lot. They keep um, selling the fucking thing. I and know. It, it will never stop so yeah. good imagine good. Make, making something that just keeps selling that would be nice <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind i, I would I, be okay with that i know the album was last certified four times multi-platinum back in 95 and it was originally given gold and platinum certification shortly after its release in release in 81 then two times multi-platinum status in october of 84 it's been a long time since rush a uh, long time since any Rush studio album was given gold or platinum certification by the RIAA, with the last one being Roll the Bones, platinum certification 20 years ago, huh. back in 2001. Interesting. Wow. Crazy, right? I didn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, recently, Getty Lee uh, took to Instagram on 420 to promote his daughter Kyla's role in the new film, The Marijuana Conspiracy. Interesting. Uh, the unofficial holiday, which celebrates marijuana and cannabis culture, uh, in celebration of the day, Getty Lee took to Instagram to help promote the release of the 220, uh, 2020 film, The Marijuana Conspiracy, which features uh, or includes his daughter Kyla and the ensemble cast. Getty also gives a shout out to his BFF, Alex Lifeson, who he refers to as lovingly as the pothead of the universe. <laughs> Here's what Ged had to say. It's now making uh, a lot of sense uh, yes. when you well, look at Alex, it, right? It all adds uh, up. I know, I know. Jeez. Uh, I, I don't usually, this is what Ged had to say. I don't usually post things about my kids and social media, but today I'm making an exception to shamelessly promote a film in which my daughter, Kyla Young, is a member of the uh, ensemble cast. It's called The Marijuana Conspiracy, and it comes out today, 420, a.k.a. Marijuana Day which is also my BFF Alex's favorite day of the year because, well, he is the pothead of the universe and effing proud of it. So, so congrats to my lovely daughter on her film debut. Well, congrats, Kyla, on your film debut. Hell yeah. Yeah. The film uh, is based on a true story of a, uh, of a group of young women who took part in a 98-day human experience experiment studying the effects of marijuana on females back in 1972. Getty's daughter, uh, daughter uh, billed as Kyla Avril Young, plays the role of Janice Trent in the film and can be seen on the movie's poster uh, and in the trailer. Uh, she also, uh, can also be seen in several of the movie stills posted on IM, IMDb. Uh, Rush fans probably remember her from her role as Kugel in the opening video for Rush's Time Machine tour. Get includes a photo of himself and Kyla from that video shoot on his Instagram. Huh. Um, the film was first released uh, last year at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival, but uh, just went into wide release earlier this year, 420, as appropriate uh, as it is. Well, uh, big news all around. Primus is um, uh, continuing on. Uh, they had canceled dates uh, for their a, tribu a Tribute to King's Rush Tribute Tour. Uh, and it's going to go forward with rescheduled dates starting in August. Last year, Primus was forced to postpone their planned 2020 A Tribute to King's Rush Tribute Tour uh, to the summer of 2021 due to COVID-19 restrictions. And they just recently confirmed that they will tour. The tour will indeed go forward with uh, rescheduled dates beginning in August. The tour will honor the band's musical heroes, Rush, uh, where they'll cover A Farewell to Kings, uh, the entire album, every night before uh, playing a full set of Primus class classics. Wow. Are, you a, are you a Primus fan? Uh, I respect them as musicians. Uh, I cannot listen to the music. No. But I respect them as musicians. Yeah, yeah. Uh, part of it is just because my son is a huge South Park fan. Yeah. And I have to hear the opening music like 18 times a day. And uh, it's affected my ability to, you know, sort of appreciate it in, a, in an impartial way. <laughs> great musicians though absolutely yeah. excellent oh yeah, musicians. yeah excellent musicians yeah. uh it's it's again it's an acquired taste much like yeah. Rush, right uh and uh, of course les claypool is, is known for his ability to play outstanding bass i have absolutely no doubt that they will execute that you know the performance of that album perfectly every single night of the tour i know they will do that so yeah, yeah definitely yeah. go by all means special guest wolf mother 
uh, will be uh, joining for the entire tour and the sword will open nice. on select dates who are pretty good the sword's pretty yeah. good yeah uh all original tickets will be honored honored and uh definitely check them check out those dates as they come along and i'm sure there'll be a lot of rush fans there yeah and there's gonna be a lot of people i guess with like you know one year old wrinkly tickets that have been sitting there on the on the shelf waiting to get used you know it's, <laughs> but it's good i'm glad it's, we're getting out there finally. mask mask wearing fans with wrinkly tickets that's okay. <laughs> Ultimate Guitar posted uh, their list, uh, another list, 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 the year of the list uh, of the top eight amazing rock and metal songs inspired by science fiction and fantasy works. Uh, of course, Rush's 2112 made the cut. Mm -hmm. Being the glorious nerds that he was, Rush's Neil Pe Peart often drew inspiration for fantasy works by authors like Token and uh, Ayn, Ayn Rand. And uh, 2112 is probably the most famous example of such cross-pollination with a running time of over 20 minutes. 2112 is one of the most ambitious prog rock songs that the 70s has given us. And having been featured in most Rush set lists, at least in part, it is one of the fondest memories rush fans have from the progressive golden era yeah and uh that's uh, uh a good appointment there that's a smart move Great um, one. yeah so in um some rush related trivia here from um the 2019 rem biography begin the begin involving michael stipe's first performance at a high school battle of the bands uh this was in P a pitchfork article are you, by the way are you an rem fan uh no but my my wife used to be a tour manager during the 1990s oh. and she was on tour with them and oh. uh they're great guys and you know i'm i'm not into the music but they're great people she had nothing but good things to say about them cool yeah awesome um in one common legend rem frontman michael stipe was inspired to sing after hearing patty smith's 1975 album horses lurie can't uh quite confirm or deny that but he does find something just as crucial to Stipe's future as a vocalist. A, 19, a 1977 battle of the bands at his high school in St. Louis. Stipe's classmate, Greg Franklin, asked him to enter and says Stipe replied, I don't sing. But Franklin eventually convinced Stipe to join his group called um, simply the band on covers of Rolling Stones. Wow. Give me shelter. There it is. <laughs> then, and Rush's working man, likely his first ever public performance. Yeah. Did, wow, you, did you ever hear that one before that, that no but that? that's that's i cannot imagine him singing that song me neither, i cannot man. fathom what that might sound like i know me anyone neither. has a tape please we send it in we oh, would love, love to, to hear that, that. Uh, musicradar.com posted the results of their online poll to determine the greatest drummers of all time and uh I'm sure we could guess who made it, who came in the top, the very top of that list. Hmm, yeah, who could good. that be? Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, you can find the results of that uh, poll online. Well, um, you know, here we are at our, at our guests. And of course, we always try to have uh, interesting guests on our show. And this week is no different. Um, this is sort of a, a hybrid guest, I would have to say, um, both super fan and someone who's actually brought Rush into their sort of ethos of, of, of who they are in the professional world. Whether uh, other people wanted it or not. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. It, he, yeah. There's no uh, apprehension there. This is who I am. And this is the band that defines me and what I yeah. do. And you're, and you're going to sit there and you're going to like it. And that's how it is. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, let's reveal uh, the guest is uh, Phil Simon, uh, who's known as a keynote speaker and world renowned technology and collaboration authority. He's an award winning author of seven, excuse me, 11 business books and counting i think he was working on another when we interviewed him uh most recently reimagine reimagining collaboration slack microsoft teams zoom and the post-covid world of work a slack and zoom trainer and coach uh, he's also a freelance writer frequent contributor to harvard business review wired the wall street journal the new york times and many other prominent media outlets he's a technology and analytics professor for hire and the host of the conversations about collaboration podcast which you should all check out most famously phil a uh, great guy uh in october of 2014 he interviewed neil peart who had just published far and near on days like these a collection of observations and stories neil's wonderful book and we'd like to welcome phil simon to two guys talking rush hey guys 
Hey. Hey, welcome. Mr. Simon, how are you, sir? Doing well. How are you? Okay. I love the hat. Where are you guys? Oh, oh thanks, man. Dan? Oh, uh, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Oh, whereabouts? You used to live in Brooklyn. Oh, uh, Bay Ridge. Okay. I lived in yeah. Brooklyn Heights for a hot minute. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah, I lived there for about like five seconds and then uh, realized I didn't have enough money and moved to Bay Ridge, <laughs> which which is how it often goes. That's cool. funny. How about you, John? Yeah. I'm, in, I'm in New Hampshire. I'm in New Hampshire. Digging John is your, living uh, free or dying. Hardly. That's that's a bunch of bullshit. Yeah, um, <laughs> my uh, favorite show is Breaking Bad and the um, second to uh, last... Or wait, was it the first episode of season 5b is live free or die <laughs> is it right i yeah. kind of vaguely remember that oh yeah. i don't know i i binged that entire show like you know like in a series of like three o'clock in the morning sessions and i remember nothing other than that the fifth season was really really hard to get through yeah. uh, that's it, it it's dark yeah fun is fact in the, in the prequel yeah. better call saul yeah, um, Saul Goodman has uh, at one point a Rush poster. You might have seen that on Ed's blog. I remember that. Yeah, I remember. Oh, that. yeah, yeah. I'll have to check again. Yeah. Now, you have you have quite a nice Rush poster behind you. I'd like to say. Yeah, I, uh, one of many. I've got some autograph swag from. Uh, I got the three R thirty um, pictures from Ed, uh, Alex Getty and Neil signed, framed. And then nice. I've got a um, couple of autographed Neil books. And then I've got autographed um, when I met Getty in 2000 on my favorite headache. And then uh, I've got a good story on that. And then I've got um, uh, an autographed copy of the big, beautiful book of base, which barely fits on my bookshelf. That thing is enormous. That thing is a beast. That thing oh. is a beast. I, I know. I, I picked, you have I mean, that, that, It's like. Do you have that, Dan? No, but I, oh. I, I picked up a copy of it, and it's no. like, don't drop it on your foot. No, <laughs> that's that thing is a. Yeah, you will, you will go done. to the emergency room. I, I just wish that they'd made the font a bit bigger because I don't have the best vision, and it's such a big book uh, to have such a small font. But you know, I don't know how I miss deal. miss that book tour when they came to Brookline Booksmith, uh, which was nearest to me. I, I totally missed the boat on that man. I don't know, maybe it was my five year old. Um, okay, diverting the situation, but uh, no, I'm I, I'm I'm originally from Massachusetts. I'm a I'm a I'm a true masshole, and uh, okay. yeah, so New Hampshire is just sort of I'm sort of a transplant up here, but uh, it's a good place to live. You know, where are you, Phil? I am in Gilbert, Arizona. In fact, oh. um, I met. It's now a year and a half. So before the pandemic, Ged was here promoting Big Beautiful Book of Bass, and uh, I I've, I couldn't get to top. Tens. I got my top eight favorite Rush stories, but the meeting Getty twice are that those are two of the eight. So I'll, uh, I'll I won't tell you the story now. I'm, I'm, I know some of your pods run over an hour, and I had some of my friends. I told them I was going to be on this pod. They said you could talk for an hour about Rush. <laughs> said, oh please, we have we have part, part one, two, about- part two. Yeah, yeah. This there's so much content, man, and uh, that's the funny thing about. Yeah this sort of thing. I think our competing podcast sort of keeps it uh, at an hour or 45 minutes, but you know, we usually just break it up at first. We were thinking like, Oh, should we have just keep it contained or just whatever keep, but in, in the, in the style of rush, it's an opus, you know, it's, it's, it's the yeah. big thing. So, you know, part right, four, you know, whatever. signatures. And <laughs> yeah, we'll, start exactly. with, we'll start with the overture. Exactly. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort that's, of true. that's fair to say, but you know, I mean, we're, but you know, we're all, fans we're all avid fans and i could just go on about this forever ask yeah. ask my wife i can talk about this forever you know yeah, yeah. it's it never gets old for me and i really like hearing from other people yeah. about it and, you know it, it makes me feel like oh, okay like i'm a part of something and like yeah. this this matters to people um how did how did you like just for people who don't know you how did you sort of come to be in the rush orbit initially Oh, I had the, gosh, I'm 48. Someone gave me a, a copy cassette of moving pictures when I was, I think, in nine. And um, then I also got signals, but it didn't occur to me that they were the same band, especially since they were copies. I go, well, that's oh, okay. This is nothing like this band Rush, because clearly, even at that young age, 
I appreciated that. But um, yeah, I went through my cheese metal rat phase, you know, oh, uh, gosh. Uh, but then around 16, just went back to Rush and then um, went, finally got to see them on Roll the Bones in Pittsburgh when I went to school at Carnegie Mellon, and, which is on my list. Um, and then, yeah, just uh, as soon as I could drive my my car, I'd have the bumper stickers and would drive. I'd so, so I saw them a minimum of two times per tour in, until the end. Um, I'm assuming you guys are well into double digits as well. I am not actually, but oh, uh, interesting. Th- th- yeah, I I have personal issues. Uh, okay. But no, for I mean, most of the people we have on the show, we have people who've been on like 60 times, 120 times. Yeah, that's that's normal uh for yeah. a lot of rush fans uh, you know and it's you can see them over and over again and never get bored yeah and they're certainly never going to turn in a bad show i've never heard yeah. of it happening yeah. in like what like 900 <laughs> shows that they played in their history or something like oh, that oh no it had to be a lot more than that because they were doing five six shows a night uh, per year in the early years so if i had a guess i'm sure it's out there online but oh it's got to be if i had a guess at, at least three or four thousand right Oh, I was, I mean, I was talking about like when they were like established with a record out professional, like that's not in their early history when they were playing bars and that sort of thing. I mean, like when they were a sign band with Neil in the band, uh, I think the number I saw was like 900 something that they played. It was less than I thought because yeah, I thought it would be like 10,000 shows or something okay, like so that. So that's, that's, are... a, that's a question for our fans because we know we have fans listening to this. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, we, and we can find that information out, but we love the uh, the uh, exchange and, and all that. So if anybody's listening, hopefully there, there are a few. Uh, send in what yeah, you know. I, w- I would take the over on 900 with Neil because they used mm. to play. I mean, if that's the, the litmus test, um, you know, with John Rutsey, I'm sure it's under 900 but no i i would go north of that but uh rush fans are good at math and good at computers yes. so we'll, yes, we'll figure it out oh how yeah. about you john how many times did you get to see uh, the you know what i was Holy looking Trinity? at i was looking at my concert i i've kept nearly every concert stub that i've ever had i always made it a point to stick it away and you know if it never got caught in the shower or the in the in the washing machine you know a few times it had but uh, i've always managed to keep them in uh, the rush ones especially um you know, I remember always being at the show and thinking like, Ooh, I got to keep this somewhere safe. I, I want to look at it someday. And uh, I was just looking at them. I think around 45 times I've seen rush. And that was beginning with hold your fire. Uh, nice. So I'd mostly see all the new England dates and uh, Connecticut and, and, and all that Providence. Um, yeah. Oh, so you were at the Hartford show first, uh, first show on vapor trails. I believe I was, I've seen, I've seen a number. Of, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Um, and just, you know, what, what I miss most, I think, is the anticipation of seeing Rush. Uh, I, you know, being at the show was, was exciting and you're there and the lights go down and then you're in it. But just the, you know, knowing that they're coming and the new album coming out, there was always just a, you know, what did they do? We talked about this the previous episode. Well, each, as each album came out, you just knew there was just a different treatment. And I love that so much. It wasn't just the typical uh, kind of formula. Right, and it wasn't, I, and I, you know, Iron Maiden or ACDC, no, nothing against right. those bands, but at all, yeah, totally. Just I think you know, Rush maintained a style, but they also worked hard to give us something a little different each time. And uh, because I think they probably got bored uh, doing that, so you know, they, they made it a point. But uh, I miss that a lot. And I also, now that we're in COVID times, I miss the the arena rock, man. You know, I just do. the big shows. I know Dan isn't a huge fan of that, and that some people aren't. I like smaller shows too. But um, just the lights and the production and the, the force of, of all that, you know, like, oh, nothing yeah, like a and, rush and show. You said the interactions with, no, and it, I, I've, I've, over the last uh, 10 years, become obsessed with Marillion, actually oh, opened wow. for Rush a couple times in the wow. mid 80s. And yeah. I've actually had the chance to interview some of the members. And it's cool. the closest thing I've ever felt um, because Marillion is such a cult band, even though Rush is a cult band. Yeah. Uh, Marillion is a cult within a cult. And it's just uh, for the weekends, people will get together in Montreal from 28 countries. I met a woman who flew in from Australia and they do this swap the band thing, which is exactly what it sounds like. And this woman got to sing a song, swapping out the lead singer, Steve Hogarth. And I just asked her 30 hours door to door, was it worth it? She just said, oh, fuck yeah. 
Yeah, so uh-huh. it's the only thing I've ever seen, um, you know, is getting talked about during the Hall of Fame induction, maybe the Grateful Dead, maybe Fish. Yep. But yeah, Rush is up there when it comes to fanatical people like like you and me. So um, yeah, we can record whenever you want, guys. I, I do not have a podcast after this. Um, I only have my stomach and hunger. But when I <laughs> get going on okay. Rush, uh, that yeah, should be good. Totally. Um, so Marillion, what, what hits do they have? Do they have a hit? Or are they Kaylee. sort of like Kaylee, Kaylee is the Kaylee. one probably the top forty yeah, hit. But, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, they um, um they didn't really get big here. Like they no. like I mean they made they made a little bit of inroads like right around that time, but they're very Canadian, much like right? Canadian Scotland uh, oh, Scotland. Really? Scotland, that's right. Yeah. Scotland, yes. Yeah. No, no, no. Fish is from Scotland. Um oh. they're mostly from the UK, Ireland, and okay. England. Okay. But fish left in nineteen eighty nine and the new guy, Steve Hogarth, is kind of like Neil. The new guy's been in the band for 32 years. Yeah, for like longer than the, than the old guy. Yeah. Oh, much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, he did. Yeah. Fish did four albums. Hogarth's done 14. Uh, but he's so the, and he's the a, new guy. Yeah. Right. But he'll always be the new guy. Right. Kind of like me. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and the um, if, if you start with Marbles, that is an amazing album. And if, as I said, um, uh, Rush will always be number one for me, but Marillion is one A. I'll have to take a dip a dip into some Marillion. I, I don't know. My, I always feel oh. like they get pooled in with uh, with Molly Hatchet and that sort of. Are the album co- covers similar? Or what's the? Is there a similarity there uh, with the, font style, font style, or something? Uh, I don't know why visually I'm I mean, attaching. I, yeah, a little bit. Okay. The early a stuff bit. looked a little bit like Genesis. In okay. fact, um, stylistically, they were very proggy. Yeah. Uh, and the lead singer painted himself up like Peter Gabriel. Okay. Uh, but they've become kind of art rock. I mean, it's yeah. they're not as technical as Rush, um, yeah. but their 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 lyrics and uh, it just yeah, it's the closest thing I've ever had to a religious experience being at a Marillion concert. Cool. Wow. Wow. So so where did you grow up, Phil? I mean, what, what were you like as a kid, and uh, what were you listening to? I know you mentioned you were first introduced to Rush at nine years old. That's very young um but um you know yeah. take us take By us the back way, are we recording now we're yeah, not we're right? just we're straight we up recording, recording oh now. oh yeah totally yeah, yeah oh i had no idea i thought yeah. we were doing a an intro we can we can edit oh, no it, worries right? okay no we'll do we'll do an intro um for the preamble of the show we haven't recorded this this is going to be like okay. epi- episode 50 something i mean we're we have a pipeline of 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 um of uh, guests already pre-recorded uh so i'll Got just you. edit i'll edit where necessary and we'll just we'll sort of introduce okay. you in a proper way but you know just it's all it's very fluid man so oh, yeah, yeah no yeah. no sweat do you I, do you want us do you want us not to use what we've done so far or i don't okay think with... i said anything objectionable i don't think you did either but <laughs> right. you know but I, we I just, but I, we didn't okay we didn't actually say like okay now we are recording you know Right. Well, I, we didn't I do did that. write Zoom for dummies, so you think that I know that there's a. It does. It should say that. It button. should say that on your. Uh, I was gonna. I was gonna ask you. You you wrote. That's right. You wrote Zoom for dummies. So how am I doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, a fun fact: uh, my previous book, Slack for Dummies, I dedicated uh, to Neil uh, because he had he had passed, and um, I just you know it was a no brainer. Um, so um, and there. Were, plugs in all of my books but anyway to answer your question I, I grew up in New Jersey and was definitely one of the uh the smart kids as opposed to one of the cool kids right subdivisions definitely struck home with me I wasn't terribly good at sports I was on the debate team and the math league and the young politicians club and you know it was something about rush that kind of drew me in even when I didn't know what the lyrics meant in fact I remember not knowing what an anagram was and listening on presto to anagram for mongo and not understanding the lyrics at all and then I watched Blazing Saddles and someone explained me what an anagram was or I looked it up and go, wait a minute, he and she are in the house, but there's only me at home. Miracles will have their claimers. Or the, co- the cosmic is largely comic. I go, who does this? <laughs> only those <laughs> this guys. Is, this is rock for smart people. So I'm a smart person. And, you know, like they mentioned in the documentary, uh, it's just feeling like you had um, you know, companionship and, you know, yes, it was good music. And if you didn't understand the lyrics, you could still in, you know, dig it, but um, there was something there. If you said, wait a minute, this is based on Ayn Rand. So of course I read The Fountainhead. And, and even though I don't agree with her politics, it is still a, a really interesting book. And the fact that you had, you know, Neil talked about during Manhattan Project reading, you know, a dozen books to write 350 words of lyrics for the start of the, the nuclear age. I mean, just mm-hmm. there's something about that. And, and, and in fact, um, uh, when I met 
Getty the second time at the, the book signing in Phoenix, um, my friend um, Bob and I brought him a nice bottle of wine and, and a card. Um, and, uh, and the inscription was, um, thank you for not only what you've done, but, but how you've done it, because they've just been so, so classy. Hmm. And uh, I joked with him, you know, when we gave him the wine, uh, we were going to get you a base, but you kind of have the ball. And he laughed and said, oh, I'm yeah. an alcoholic. Give me the wine. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's awesome. That's really cool. So you you have sort of uh, developed this career, um, sort of multifaceted. Uh, you're an author, uh, speak, public speaker, trainer, professor, advisor. H- how has all this, how has Rush sort of um, defined all this in you? It, have, do you, does, because Rush, and this is how we got you on the show or realized that you should be on the show is that you sort of reference rush a lot uh, in oh, your, yeah. in your work. Yeah. So to me, it seems as though since you are doing that pur- purposely that somehow rush has influenced you to become who you are. And is that a true statement? Oh, absolutely. I was a college professor for four years at ASU. And by the second week of class, they knew from all of my slides, I, I don't do boring PowerPoint slides. There will always be, you know, Rush or Marillion or Breaking Bad in the background. They, they always knew my favorite band was Rush. In fact, my favorite show was Breaking Bad. In fact, I used to do an icebreaker and those were the, you know, basically give me a fun fact. And those were my two fun facts. But no, absolutely. I remember in 2011, I had an offer to write a book from a publisher and they wanted to do it in a year and a half. The book became The Age of the Platform, How Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google Have Redefined Business. And I said, a year and a half that seems like a really long time. I'm not that smart. Other people are talking about these companies. Even a decade later, people are still talking about those companies. And I decided to crowdfund the book and run it through a publishing company that I had started. And I said, this is my 2112 moment, right? I'm going to either succeed with this book or go out on my own terms. And I thought a lot about Caress of Steel, the Down the Tube store from 1975 that they mentioned in the, the documentary. And gosh, the two dozen or so books that I've read about Rush. And I gave this talk in Vegas, how Rush has inspired me as a writer. If you want, we can include that in the show notes. It's on YouTube or Vimeo or, or one of them. But yeah, it really did inspire me and said, you know what? I'd, I'd like to fail or succeed on my own terms. So the book did well. It won an award. It got translated into a couple of languages and sold a bunch of copies. And yeah, part of me was just that, uh, you know, that maverick, that, that, you know, the Rush person saying, we're going to do it our way. And then you know, I proved to people that I could sell books and, you know, haven't sold as many books as Russia sold albums, Dare to Dream. But I do feel like I've had success to some extent on my own terms and, you know, bands or artists or actors or uh, musicians who churn out the same stuff over and over again. You know, that's fine, but there is a certain satisfaction. What is the lyric from uh, Far Cry? Right? Yeah. A certain uh, s- uh, satisfaction and a willingness to risk defeat. I love yes. that lyric. Yeah, that's great. That's a wonderful tune. So are you, are you a technology writer? How, how, how would you define your writing? Are you a, 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 how, how what, and what sort of style do you write in? Um, you've, you've written a number of technology-based books. Um, what's your, how would you define yourself as a writer and the content in which, in which you produce? Definitely nonfiction. Yeah. I will <laughs> anonymize people and stories. In fact, a lot of my case studies, I'll say that the, IT manager was Lars and the um, head of marketing was Getty. Wow. Isn't Lars from Metallica? And isn't Getty yes. from Super S? Plausible deniability. Very good. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I have fun with that. If you can't keep yourself interested, even in my most recent book, Reimagining Collaboration, yeah. uh, there was a company, but I couldn't use the name. So I named it Cygnus. And I said the three employees were Alex, Getty, and Neil. But uh, yeah. the way I describe my writing is I'm sort of at the intersection of business data, people, and technology. And yeah kind of how they all collide. Mm -hmm. But I try to bring some personality to my writing. I, one of my favorite quotes is there's no such thing as a boring subject, only a boring writer or a boring speaker. And I'm always dropping in pop culture references, you know, tons of movies, TV shows, rock bands, but uh, you know, the bar is low. If you're writing a book about big data, people go, gosh, that sounds boring. Just hearing about it. Well, Mm -hmm. it's actually really interesting when you think about what you can do with this information, both good and bad. So yeah, I am again, inspired by Rush or, or Marillion, you know, people who are just ridiculously talented yet incredibly humble people. Um, I think a lot about that. So I'll take what I'm doing seriously when I'm writing or when I'm speaking, but not taking myself that seriously. 
So if there's a, a snafu on stage with the AV or someone finds a typo in one of my books, you know, of course it annoys me, but I try to be humble about it. And you know, I don't have a shirt, what would Rush do? But I, I probably should. <laughs> Do people, I mean, do people get it when you make, when you make these references and, you know, refer to the, no, just sales yeah, right know, over their heads or. Eight times out of 10, no, but so there's this reference in uh, one of my books, the visual organization to breaking bad. And I won't ruin it for anyone who hasn't seen the show, but 99 out of a hundred go, uh, what the hell is he talking about? But there's that one in a hundred yeah. right, that goes, wait a minute. I get that. That's genius. So again, it's kind of an eclectic taste, but um, yeah, I don't try to try to pander and I, I won't throw in too many Rolling Stones or U2 references. I almost feel like uh, I've, got, I've got this theory about myself in movies, TV shows, rock bands, books. The more obscure it is, the more likely I'll like it, right? So I've never seen Game of Thrones. I'm sure that it's awesome, um, but everyone's saying, oh, you got to see Game of Thrones. And I remember with Breaking Bad, I jumped on the train early on and I was trying to convert people. If I jumped on later and everyone said, once it had hit the zeitgeist, oh, you got to see Breaking Bad, guys, see Breaking Bad. I was said, oh, I don't know. And it's the same thing with Rush, right? The fact that people said, oh, Rush, you mean the guy with the right, really high voice and the really long songs go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you meet another Rush fan, you feel that kinship, right? That you wouldn't yeah. feel if you said, oh, you like Metallica, especially later on when they became huge. Yeah, everyone likes Metallica, yeah, big deal. Um, or did it, did it bother you when Rush became sort of mainstream? No. No? There's, a, there's this great quote from an investor, I forget the name, something like, um, they'll come around because um, I'm right and you're smart. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, you know, I, I figured that the more Rush fans, the better. It was. I mean, it was always difficult to get a good concert ticket, right? I mean, you know, when I saw Rush, they would play it, gosh, anywhere from, you know, 10 to 20,000 stadium um, seat stadiums. But no, I mean, more people liking what you like, uh, you know, I mean, if it meant that I had to pay a little bit more for a ticket to see a three hour show and plus meet some, some just incredibly cool people, present company included. It's just, uh, you, know, uh, you know, they did it on their terms, I guess. Right. They didn't, you know, if you think about, yes, you know, Time to Stand Still is more of a commercial type of song. But again, with the success of 2112 in 1976, they basically said, we'll do what we want. We'll give you the record, right? And they certainly, as you guys know, evolved with the times, but I never felt like they were intentionally trying to become Bon Jovi, um, you know, and even, you know, uh, Clockwork Angels has some eight or nine minute songs, which you'd never hear on the radio, so you know, they did it on their terms. And I have a lot of respect for that because when I tackle a book project, I don't want to repeat myself and write, you know, the age of the platform part two or part three any more than Rush wanted to do 2113. Uh, sorry, Kevin Anderson. I know he's got a book by that title, but you know, they, they were always evolving. And I, I just have a lot of respect for people who will risk failure knowing that, you know, people may not like what they're doing, but that's how you grow as a musician or a writer or an artist or a person. Yeah, it's it's great that you're here because I mean you're you're, you're sort of the very essence you, know, you you being a guest of this caliper you're sort of the essence of what this show is all about um, you know just loving this band so much and then sort of evolve your career evolving and and being shaped into what it is now and then sort of rush mirroring that in some way you know you include rush in this conversation uh of your profession and that's really great i mean that's that embodies what the show's about that's you're the perfect guest for the show in that way um and that's <laughs> a com bar that's too a high for me i'm, I'm gonna disappoint you <laughs> no that's just, a, say that's... I'm ad, just say i'm adequate then i'll exceed well the no yeah you know, we we feel we feel very strongly that what I mean, yes, we've had a lot of people on who worked with the band, you know, knew the band directly, that sort of thing. But we also have fan shows of you know people who just just love the band. That's their life. It's about just listening to them and just enjoying it and seeing them and that sort of thing. They would never have done what they did or gotten to where they got without people like you and just regular fans and that sort of thing. And I I think they would agree with that if we were to ask them that. And it's important to recognize, you know, pe you, uh, during, uh, during lockdown, I stopped cutting my hair. 
And my, my wife and I would have, would like talk about it sometimes. She'd be like, do you want to cut it? Don't you want to cut it? And I'd be like, I don't know. I haven't made a decision. She goes, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. It's, you just, there, you know, it's just these little seeds that get planted everywhere. And I totally get like, you know, you do a piece of technical writing or medical writing or something like that. The temptation is really overpowering to be like, I have to put something in there. I, and see if anyone notices. I have to uh, like a little rush landmine and just see if anyone gets it. 99% of the time, no one gets it, but it's about the, like, the thrill that you get from just putting that little nugget in there. Even if no one cares, it's, it's for you. It's why you're doing it. But, but also it, I, yeah. it, it keeps the story of rush going in some way. Yes. Um, they're like little Easter eggs, you know, and that's what it's about. And, mm -hmm. And I think you maybe know, that's what I meant. Instead of landmines, I should have said Easter eggs. That's that's better. <laughs> better connotation. Well, well, yes. Okay. Well, I mean, it's it's proven on Rush as a band. I mean, every little thing about Rush shows up there, you know. And uh, if someone writes about Rush or references Rush somewhere, it's there. And that platform is for all of us. And uh, I was exposed to your work through that website and um i wanted to ask you you know just looking back i just you know ed stanger is a friend of the show and i did a little uh, uh looking back on the Wayback machine and you've sort of contributed to rush's event quite a bit i mean there's a lot of entries and uh pieces of information that you've submitted to rush's event is that true Phil, it seems as so. though. Yeah, whether it was referencing them in books and yeah. putting on my marketing hat, but also knowing that there'd be Rush fans uh -huh. who would actually go, oh yeah, I, even though the book was translated into Korean and I don't understand a single word of it, there's a picture of Rush from iTunes back when yeah. there was iTunes, yeah. uh, stuff like that. And I actually had a chance to, to finally meet Ed in, um, I think it was 2014 at the Rock and, Roll, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction, which by the way, if you guys want, I've got a couple of good stories behind that one. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Why don't you share, share some of those stories with us, man? What's, uh, you know. Yeah, so at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, even though I'm sure you guys have seen it more than once on HBO, let's just say completely sanitized, mm -hmm. right? They took off when, uh, so first of all, 80% of the people there had on Rush shirts, right? Yeah. There were maybe 20% of the other people. And, you know, so Hart gets inducted, you know, props to them. Yeah. Um, uh, Donna Summer, not a huge uh, uh, fan, but, you know, certainly a lot of respect. But then um, once the, um, uh, I think it's, ja is it Jan? Is Jan Wenner. Yeah. Right, he gets Jan. out. Yeah. Jan, uh, we probably booed him for a good three minutes because as you guys know, he was, I know, right? <laughs> uh, good. The, the, Russ was eligible for 19 years and, and yeah. it was completely absurd. So we, we booed the hell out of him and I have never heard a crowd as loud and I, they shortened it when they showed it on HBO and I'm sure you can find YouTube clips, but. I mean, just absolute madness. And then they finally get up and um, they take the, they say rush. And then again, another just, so they edited it, but it was even louder and longer than they had expected. And then I was starting to daze, uh, doze off a little bit um, because of course they had rush on last and, uh, but totally worth it. It just, um, you know, I, I shed a tear and, I remember paying, I think, 300 bucks for a ticket the minute it came out because I didn't want to miss it. I was living in Vegas. I drove up to L.A. for the Staples Center, and I probably could have got a ticket for 60 bucks if I'd waited, but there was no way I was going to miss that. And uh, even the pre-party before, just talking to people and doing what we're doing now, exchanging the stories about the, the band and, and what, the, what they've meant to us. So that was, um, I got my list here. I'm going to check off Hall of Fame induction, but that was definitely on my top list of Rush memories. What was your take on Alex? Alex's speech was that do you think he was sliding yeah. the whole institution uh do you think it was his way of saying f you to Jan Wenner uh by sort of blah 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 you know from what I know of Alex and I've only got the fist bump from him once um I'll tell you that story later if you like uh, I don't think he's that kind of person and yeah I, I, it just doesn't seem mean-spirited in fact the right. only time I think he'd really gotten in trouble was in Florida when a cop tasered him, I think there was a lawsuit. But again, just yep. you know, compared to a Motley Crew, right, or right. another band where right. constant or Guns and Roses, right, were constantly in the news for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. Um, I've read a couple of interviews. I don't. I think I forget. I think I interviewed Neil before that. Um, I have 2014. I got the sense, 
2014. I'd have to yeah. Yeah, I, I, that whole thing was a blur. We'll, we'll talk about that. I was so freaking yeah. nervous. But I, 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 for what um, I've read in some interviews, I think he was going to give a random speech and just decided to wing it. And even I'm no guitarist or musician, screwed around the bass with the, for the bass for a couple of years, wanting to learn Rush when my teacher's just laughing at me. But from what I understand, Getty's mentioned this in interviews, Alex is a very intuitive player. Um, yeah. And just kind of feels it, so um, and maybe he might have had a little of the uh, wacky tobacco going oh, on. Yeah, that could that could be it. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I just uh, I, I've seen that scene for that uh, that clip probably ten times. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it just felt very organic, and you know we didn't know what the hell he was doing at the time live, but uh, by by the end we kind of figured it out, and you know blah 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 blah. blah. Just, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, I'm sure you guys saw this when uh, Alex and. Um, Getty inducted um, yes into the Hall of Fame in Brooklyn. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had on the, uh, the sh- um, no, I don't know if he had the shirt on, but uh, he says something when Alex is, he goes blah, blah, blah to Alex. Yeah. That's yeah. funny. Yeah. Too funny. Well, get, you know, getting into this interview here, far and near, an interview with Neil Peart, um, how, how did that come to be? How did you get that, the opportunity to interview Neil? Oh, I photoshopped a bunch of image of him and told him that he, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have a mutual friend, uh, Ke- Kevin J. Anderson. Yes. Uh, I'd interviewed a few times for the yeah. Huffington Post. I used to write for HuffPo. And I uh, was just always a very nice guy. He sent me some books. And then uh, I don't know if I asked him or he asked me, but he said, regardless, um, he said, would you like to interview Neil? Yeah, no. <laughs> So uh, yeah, it happened over <laughs> Skype and, and I was so freaking nervous. Um, sure. I had wanted to post the video, but Neil said, um, you know, he, he didn't want any crappy videos out there. So I said, okay, you know, whatever, whatever you want, I'll, I'll transcribe it. Um, yeah. I didn't think the same um, quality of translation software was available then as is today, but you know, it was the labor of love and I just didn't want to screw up. And I remember he had a red car in the background and I, thought it might have been a red barchetta but it wasn't and just um you know i i just didn't want to screw up man it was just yeah. surreal and uh to this day the most popular post on my website and this is thanks to ed posting it on rush as a band hey ed how you doing yeah. uh, is is that one and um i i did tape the video uh, just so i could transcribe it and I never posted it and I never would. I've only showed it to one of my friends when I lived in Vegas and about three minutes in, she stopped and said, just look at your face and this ridiculously wide grin, just completely surreal. But um, yeah, how, do you, how do you prepare? How do you, how do you prepare for something like that? Um, you said you were nervous. Uh, cold, cold, cold showers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just the, my mantra was just, you know, don't, don't act like an ass because I know it's Skype, but you know, we all knew that, uh, Neil was you know, not too keen on people going, oh my gosh, you're amazing. Yeah. Um, so I, that much I did know. In fact, my funniest, uh, one of my funniest um, memories of the documentary, and I was at the premiere, I could tell you that story as well, was the, um, the guy from Audio Slave. I forget his name. He's got the crazy tat- tattoos. Basically, he's a shirt tattooed on him saying, if, uh, you know, if I didn't know me, I'd be scared of me too. <laughs> <laughs> when Neil asked him the, the security to come away. So I, uh, I just didn't want to be uh, effusive. Um, and just, you know, when I've done the other interviews, I got to interview some other musicians and actors, uh, Steve Wilson, that was also another one I was really nervous about uh, for hand cannot erase. Um, I, uh, I just didn't want to screw anything up. So uh, I did my homework. I had my questions, but, you know, I, normally when I do my podcast or when I did interviews, it would be a little bit more improv kind of like if you guys watch the show Curve Enthusiasm. Yeah. yeah. So it's semi-scripted. I know I'm coming on to talk about Rush, but you guys don't appear to be you know, going down eight questions in sequential order. Right. But for that, I said, you know, don't, don't riff too much because, uh, you know, uh, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I mean, to this day, it's one of my, my 10 life highlights, just again, completely surreal. And then when I went to see Rush on R40, the, um, I, I saw them once in Vegas where I was living, but I had a speaking gig out in North Carolina and Rush was playing and Neil left me a ticket 
and I showed a few people who went with me, you know, for Phil Simon from Neil Peart. Wow. And I showed it to people and they go, I want to kill you. <laughs> it's so lucky. So he, he was kind enough to leave a ticket for me. Yeah. That's some like bucket list stuff right there. That's pretty good. Yeah. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, it's it. a great show. So um, you, you write uh, about these subjects. Is there a particular era of Rush that you love more than others? And I'm leaning towards the more sort of 80s era of Rush where technology seems to be driving the band in a certain way. Is that, is that your favorite era of Rush? Or would you? No, I, 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 I like stuff from, in fact, I, I think the, I don't know if you want to call it the last era of Rush, but uh, gosh, I, I think that uh, uh, Clockwork is just a criminally underrated album. Yep. I mean, for a band 40 years in to put out an album like yep. that, I mean, the stuff they did with Nick Raskulinitz, I think is amazing. And in, in a way, I feel like they've, they've come full circle um, because they were incorporating, you know, they, they mentioned this with starting with Counterparts and was it uh, The Caveman when Alex wanted the reverb and he wouldn't give it to him because he wanted a more organic sound for that record. But they wouldn't have done that if they had, hadn't gone through a softer error with, um, you know, uh, Power Windows or Hold Your Fire, which, you know, isn't my favorite album. But, you know, there's songs on like that turn the page. I love the bass line or Prime Mover. So, um, you know, I, I mean, the sweet, you know, it's moving pictures is such a freaking masterpiece. I think of, I feel like if I hadn't listened to that so much, I'd appreciate it more. But you know, the other day I was on the treadmill and I queued up R40 and was listening to, you know, that and you know, I mean, uh, or even if you find on YouTube Exit Stage Left, I don't have the DVD of that one. I could never find it, but I like it all. Um, you know, yeah. it, it depends on the day. I just I, I respect the fact that they were willing to blow up their sound. And you know, how many bands would have said, "Great, we found the formula. Let's make moving pictures over and over again." And to this day, other than maybe U2 with, with Pop, whatever the previous album was, I mean, it's, it's almost unrecognizable, right? The um, uh, signals compared to moving pictures. I mean, it barely sounds like the same band and it have the courage to do that. Uh, it's, there's, I'm, there's, I mean, there's threads through them both, I think, where it's, you know, where it's like, okay, we can see how this is sort of a progression from this thing. I don't, I don't actually agree that it's like that much of a sea change from moving pictures to signals uh signals is my favorite album of theirs uh moving pictures is very close and i do see that there are some differences and you know that they were definitely trying to like move in this other direction but they they don't seem to me to be like different different you know it wasn't like when power windows happened it was just like whoa what just happened there um but you know i they stopped working with, uh, you know, Terry Brown, the producer after Signals for whatever reason. I, what I hear is like that they felt like they needed to kind of like shake things up a little bit and stop doing things the way they had been doing them. You know, the, he was their producer for almost their entire history. Um, Have and you seen the behind or not behind the classic albums? They've got 2112 yeah. and. So they actually have them back in the studio with, with Terry and they, they talk a little bit about that as well as, you know, during the documentary. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it seemed to me like they, they like him and respect him a lot and they didn't want to get too uh, specific about why they wanted to move on. They were kind of, in, to my mind, they were a little vague about it, like strategically. So, uh, you know, cause I mean, he, they owe him a lot and uh, you know, he was there, you know through you know through good and bad for all of it uh and i could see them just you know wanting to be like you know we're, we have matured a bit now and we want to try something else no offense to you whatsoever but we need to move in this direction now and i could see how talking about that like decades later might be you know that you know they just want to be careful about how they phrase it you know Okay, well, very polite and very Canadian. But, right. Yeah. You know, like I, yeah. As I said, I've got zero musical ability. I could do uh, very little rush on my bass guitar back when I was 18 or 19. And even the stuff I was doing, I didn't really understand. I just could look at basically the cheat sheet. But it is, uh, it is interesting to try anything creative in a different uh, um, direction. I know when I wrote the, the two dummies books, 
So this is a very different type of book for me. This needs to be a tactical guide, not a big idea business book like I've been doing. And it also needs to be about an application, which of course is going to change, right? So in a year or two, it'll be partially, if not completely outdated, but it is good to challenge it that way and, and to go back and, and take those lessons. And certainly uh, as a musician, I would imagine being able to play transcends style, right? But you know the, the actual chops, um, you still need to keep sharp. Right. So I, uh, I remember uh, it was an interview, I think uh, they were talking about rehearsing to rehearse. Yeah. So before they'd get together. And I, I always, that always struck me as just vintage rush, right? I mean, just taking it so seriously that even when they get to the practice, they've already practiced. <laughs> it's, right. Yeah. It's amazing. It's like, we don't want to show up for this rehearsal without rehearsing. I get it. You know, that's, they, they cared though. They really cared about the product and they, and they cared about each other and yeah. they, they wanted to be as reliable a unit as possible. Uh, I honestly wish more people felt that way, not just in music. I mean, like when I go to the store, I, I wish I wish they would take it seriously, uh, you know, to stock the goods that I want and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, I mean, they, they were just elite, top notch musicians who just absolutely cared about all of it. They cared about every note. Took their job and, very seriously. Uh, yes, they did. Yes, they did. Yeah. Absolutely. So what, what um, you had a list, you said you compiled the list of memorable moments. And uh, I like, you know, we live in an age of lists. Yeah. <laughs> of, uh, give us your list of your most memorable moments uh, related okay. to Rush. We talked about interviewing Neil. We talked about the Hall of Fame induction. I got six more that I think are particularly um, relevant. I, I'm sure I could push for more, but um, the first time I saw them, Pittsburgh Roll the Bones tour. I think it was either 90 or 91. Sounds right. Um, yeah. It would have been I 91, just, I think. 91. 91. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was, a, I think I was a freshman or a sophomore at Carnegie Mellon and I said, okay, you're, you're going to see them. And I was uh, upper tier on the Getty side, but it was awesome. And then uh, two days later, got in a car and drove to Cleveland to see them. Um, uh, also on the list, oh, I think it was November 29th, 2000, get meeting Getty in at the Menlo Park Mall in Edison, New Jersey um, for my favorite headache. And I show up around 6.30 in November in New Jersey. It was not warm. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, you know what? Maybe a few people will be ahead of me. What do you guys think? <laughs> no. <laughs> there were people with sleeping bags. Right. Yeah. I'm sitting there, yeah. right? It's 6.30 in the morning outside waiting to get a ticket to go back to meet him. So I just, you know, and of course, you just start talking with people like I'm talking with you guys as if we've known each other for years, if, you know, we exchange right. a few emails, but and just, you know, boom, you have that bond. And, and when I would see them um, or, or Marillion or some of my other favorite bands, you'd show up sometimes by yourself, but you weren't really by yourself because you'd see someone with a shirt and before you knew it, you know, you were grabbing drinks together. Right. So, uh, but um, uh, fun part of that story was uh he was giving away a signed bass guitar and there were these somewhat annoying teenagers who were in front of me online when I finally came back and they won the golden ticket. And I thought ethically, is it right for me to <laughs> attack them? Of course I didn't do it, but I, yes. said, oh, I, was, I yes. was so close. <laughs> I was so close. It's ethically right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I wound up giving him um, a, a gift, a, a book on baseball because I knew he was a fan. And he said, "You quote that I was quote very thoughtful." So anytime a woman has ever said, "You selfish sob," I said, "Well, Kenny Lee thinks I'm thoughtful." Damn it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, and then um, we were recording before when I met uh, Getty uh, in Phoenix uh, very recently, and so I won't tell that story again. Um, this is a one of my faves. So when Roll the Bones came out in, I'm going to say '91 or late '90. Yep. Um, they didn't do a midnight opening at Tower Record back when there were Tower Records. Mm -hmm. So I was a bit surprised, but then they did a midnight opening for Guns N' Roses, Use Your Illusion 1 and 2. And I liked Guns N' Roses back then, but not as much as Rush. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll go to the opening. So it's 12.01 when they open the stores, people start going through it you know, hundreds of people online. I mean, back then, Guns N' Roses was one of the biggest bands in the world. 
So I go up to the, um, the store and I had at the time, I think all of the Rush CDs um, except for Permanent Waves. And I snuck around and I picked up a copy of Permanent Waves and then I go to the counter to pay and the guy goes one, two or both, right? And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, Guns, Guns N' Roses, Use Your Illusion, one, two or both. I go, oh no, I just want to buy Permanent Waves. Why? Does Guns N' Roses have a new album out or something? And he gives you this nice. look like, like you, you little piss ant. Anyway, <laughs> I buy the album. I walk out of the store, Permanent Waves above my head Right, and the fans are going. Is that the new Guns N' Roses or album? Is that what it looks like? No, no, this is Rush. So I just felt like I had to represent. That's and uh, I tell that story to Rush fans. They go, "Dude, you are you are insane." But <laughs> yeah, of course you are. Nice. Um, uh, when I think it was two thousand and seven when uh, Beyond the Lighted Stage came out. The issue. Yeah, two thousand ten. Oh, was it ten? Yeah. Okay. So um, I was at a family function. I was living in New Jersey and the family function was in New York, but I knew that um, the Sam Nunn and Sam, oh, what is it? Uh, what's the other guy's name? McFadden. Me. Thank you. Um, yeah. We're going to be there with Alex and Getty. So I said, look, family function, I can stay for this long, but I want to be at the premiere. Anyway, I show up at the premiere and I'm sure you guys have seen the YouTube clip when they're talking um, Alex and Getty are talking to the, the fans. Anyway, this is amazing. Um, they finish up um, and they're walking past me, Alex and Getty flanked by security. And I stick my fist out and I get the fist bump from Getty. And Alex looks at me, he shrugs his shoulders and gives me the fist bump. Long story short, <laughs> don't ask me how. Someone videotapes it. I don't know how I found it, but I put it into iMovie. I slowed it down and you see this ball dude me with a got getty t-shirt and a smile from ear to ear doing the fist bump. <laughs> nice uh so that you know i took some grief from my family but they knew it was a calling with rush that's so funny. yeah and, and then the last on my list um to this day um and um john you were saying that you were at this show too mm. uh, when i heard that rush was getting back together with, mm -hmm. with vapor trails um I was living in New Jersey, but they were playing in Hartford, Connecticut. I said, I guess right. I'm going to Hartford, Connecticut. Ninth row on the Getty side. Nice. Um, to this day, my my favorite concert. I remember reading, um, oh gosh, um, I was having a senior moment here, um, um, Ghost Rider, and just crying when uh, the cop pulls him over. I was at North Dakota and mm -hmm. said, you used to be the drummer of Rush. And he said, I wow. used to be a lot of things. I, I just started bawling. Yeah. But um, yeah, to I mean, and even in the documentary, they mentioned how much they missed doing this and how mm -hmm. much they realized they were missed. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are my my rush stories. Those are, those uh, where, are great. where were you at that show, John? I forget. I mean, I probably didn't have super seats. So I, I think that was a last minute show for me. Um, and I forget. It was always hard for me to get friends to go see Rush. I was Rush shamed mm -hmm. for many years. <laughs> I, I think I still am. Uh, so, um, whew, man, I forget where I was sitting for that one. Um, I forget. I just forget. Yeah. But I remember how significant it was. And I remember yeah. how significant that album was. Uh, it's an important, it's a very important album in the Rush catalog. You know, it's, it's a different album. It's just, it's so powerful. The songs are so big and, and uh, bold and, um, you know, I always say the song uh, Vapor Trail it could have easily been on any one of their earlier albums, you know, like Signals or Grace or something mm. like that. It just feels that it has that vibe to it, you know. Um, Earthshine, of course. But, um, yeah, incredible. Um, that was the first new one they played at that show. They led with Tom Sawyer, and I know they wanted to start off with a big statement. Yeah. And I just remember my friend Joe... Uh, well, I guess what, we, well, wait, what I remember is Neil kind of, you know, emphasizing that he's back in some way. You know, he knew that the fans just revered him so and just were so glad that he was back. And I, I think on that tour, we saw a little bit more of Neil doing that, you know, sort of acknowledging the fans. He, and Neil, Neil acknowledged the fans very minimally, but not because he did disliked the fans, just because he was sort of a shy guy and he just was... You know, he he sort of separated that uh, that persona. But on that tour, it felt like he was like, you know, I just remember that at the very end, him holding some sticks up and 
just saying I'm right on, you know. Thank you. You, know? you had a vest, didn't he? Wasn't yeah, he wearing yeah, a no. black vest? The sleeveless. Do you remember what he was wearing? He wasn't wearing a t-shirt. It was sort of like oh, a, I, I don't. Yeah, I, I, that's why I have memories of that. But yeah, um, it was, yeah. um I was talking to John Wesley, the musician who played with with Porcupine Tree. Mm-hmm. Um, they got a chance to meet him in Montreal. He um, opened for Marillion. Mm. And he was saying how, because he used to ride with Neil, how he didn't understand how Neil could do it. He'd yeah. go through a very physical bike ride and then play three hours of technically demanding music. Incredible. Uh, some foot foot ailments and all that. Incredible. And he just said, I you know, just, he said it, it, it made no sense to him. I've never been on a motorcycle, but I know Neil's a big fan. And I guess he would, you know, I guess it could be demanding on your body. I, again, yeah. I'm just, I'm just estimating, but yeah, the, uh, yeah. I, I, mean, I imagine like all of a, all, every other Rush fan uh, out there that hearing the passing of Neil must have impacted you greatly. I mean, that was just such a sad day learning that news. Yeah, I, I don't want to put it on my list of highlights, uh, mm. far from it. Yeah, but right. um, mm. for what it's worth, um, the last show I saw before lockdown was Styx at the Celebrity Theater in Phoenix. And I'd seen Styx about a year before. And uh, Neil had, they announced that Neil had passed earlier that day. So of course I wore my rush shirt and I hugged some strangers um, because, and, and it wasn't your normal rush shirt. It was Lee Lives in Peart, which some people would probably think is a law firm, but I like right. that because it's an obscure an advertising shirt. agency. <laughs> right, right, right. And a few people saw it and just, you know, we didn't even say words. We just, you know, but anyway, um, Lawrence Gowan, who's been the, the new guy in sticks since Dennis DeYoung bolted in, I think it was 1996 or 1997. So he's another new guy who's actually been in the band a lot longer than right. Dennis yeah. DeYoung played a version of limelight on piano that wound up going viral. Oh, Daniel, you saw mm-hmm. that. Yeah, yeah that it was, I mean, and just standing ovation because the, the, you know, similar bands in some way, I, I'd say that, you know, before they got, really poppy with with babe and some of those other songs early sticks is very proggy yeah very much Things so. like equinox and madam blue and you know longer thematic songs yeah. um, in fact the, the new sticks album is called um the mission about mission to mars and the first song is overture so when uh-huh. i saw that they had a new album out the first song is overture i said something tells me i'm gonna like this one and i did but yeah, yeah he played that and just was a really touching rendition um and helped us um just it was a very special moment. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been great. Um, we always ask uh, of our guests if they could give us their top five albums. If you were to choose your top five albums out of the entire Rush discography, what what would they be in what, what order? And of course, live and live said, albums are allowed. Yeah. And live albums Sorry. are allowed. <laughs> Wow, that is going to be a tough one. I'm writing them down here. I would like someone to pick all live albums just once. That would make me happy. <laughs> That's cheating. Okay, I'm, since I can it go live, yeah. it, it is cheating. Um, you should at least say one live album is allowed. Did you say that? Or is just li- yeah. all live albums allowed? Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh Again, it's not legally binding. So, you know, well, and, whatever and so happens it, is cool. So, yeah, no, I got three. Um, all right, I got four. Um, I think we might need to play the Jeopardy theme while you're doing this. If you've got mad audio, audio, audio editing chops, um, let's see. I should probably grab one from... Let me grab an earlier one. All right. Very unscientific, but I'm going to go with 5, 21, 12. I feel like I didn't have one from the error. Four, I'll go with Hemispheres. I mean, Livia and uh, Circumstances isn't my favorite song. Um, since I'm allowed to pick live albums, R40 is just, I mean, it played so, I mean, to play Jacob's Ladder, I never yeah, thought they- I'd hear that song. Um, Maybe because it's recent, I haven't played it to death as much as the other ones, Clockwork Angels. I just, I read the uh, novelization from Kevin J. Anderson, and I very, very rarely read fiction. 
but um, that was interesting. And then number one, I'll just go with moving pictures. Sorry, Dan, I know I didn't pick signals, but you can catch me <clears> it's on, okay. on a different it's day. quite all right. And, and for them to play, going back to R40, for them to play losing it, uh, which- you That know, was unexpected, definitely. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, I don't think they played it at either R40 show that I saw, because I know that um, Ben Mink played one or two, then Jonathan Dinklage played one or two. Um, but I was so happy that R40, not, not that I disliked the uh, Time Machine tour with the orchestra, because a lot of bands have played with orchestras, and it definitely gives it a different flavor. But I was really pleased that they went out with just the three of them. Yeah. Um, and just the whole, I mean, I, such a great film, such a great concept showing up on stage. And I went into the first show, I think it was in, in North Carolina, blind, not knowing it, the set list. I know some people, you know, opinions are split there, but I wanted to be surprised. And anytime someone would say it, I'd put my head over my ears, earmuffs. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. But I didn't know what mm -hmm. the hell they were doing, taking the things off the stage. And then finally, about halfway through the first set, I realized, oh, wait a minute, they're going back in time. And then the movie with Eugene Levy and the, the you know the high school from our debut album, I just thought, how cool is that to devolve in that way? And Love it. Um, but they still sounded great. And to play uh, What You're Doing, I mean, I did not think they'd play. Even to play something um, off of, uh, what was it, uh, uh, Caress. Uh, what the hell did they play off Caress? Was it uh, Lakeside Park? Lakeside Park, right. yes. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, and, and I go back, I, I didn't want to put Caress on that list, but I, I really feel like that's such a criminally underrated album. I mean, Necromancer, I saw Dream Theater do a cover of it. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I mean, just... Ba -da 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 -da. Oh, it was it was one of the early albums that I connected to, like specifically for the Necromancer. Like when you know they have that like instrument, that like jamming craziness in in the middle, and I remember like like really you know hearing that and just really being like, my God, these guys can play like motherfuckers. You know, they were, it was you know, and it was it, the sound was almost like coming a little bit out of like Live at Leeds, Who the mm -hmm. Who Live at Leeds a little bit. So like not full on heavy metal, but like in this kind of like acid rock jamming kind of a thing, like, uh, you know, like a band like Cactus or something like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but then they moved on and 2112 happened. But, you know, there was this moment uh, of like, we're a hard rock band, we're a power trio that they did that I think like Caress of Steel was sort of the last moment of that. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that album. I think it's great. And you're right. No one ever picks it. I don't know why. Yeah, I, maybe I like it because it's the most obscure album by, you know, what was up for most of my life, a very obscure band. And yeah, I could not, see why... It's sort of not over... Just... It's not listened to very much, too. I mean, that's the thing with Rush albums is we listen to them so much. Moving pictures, case in point. Um, Carissa Steele, I feel like, doesn't get a lot of play. I mean... Right. You know, so it's right. one of those albums. Well, radio stations <laughs> not playing 21 minutes of the Fountain of Land. That's yeah, right. right. You can't read, you can rediscover it that way. So, yeah, totally. Yeah. That's yeah. The, if, um, if there was one Rush you know, song that you could pick that you, you just connected to, it was your, your one, that one Rush tune that is just really pulls on you, you know, that sort of embodies you, that, that. I'll go with the elf in the room and say Tom Sawyer because I'm a stubborn son of a bitch and uh, tell me some tell me that I can't do something and it makes me want to do it and you might be right but part of me wants to find out myself and uh, it's funny when I've seen uh, or heard different treatments of earlier versions of that song uh, before it became you know the iconic synth sound that we know or when it was in a slower tempo it just wound up being so perfect and I remember I mean that was of all the rush shows I saw I think they played it at every one. Yeah, I can't right. imagine them not yeah. playing that. Yeah. Oh, they played uh, it every every tour, yeah, every show. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and then you know, sometimes I think about Everyday Glory, right? Huh. Again, another mm, fact, one. one of the things I don't know what you guys think about this, but um, I've always noticed that the Rush, the last songs on the albums were typically ones that they wouldn't play live. So Available Light on Presto, mm. um, Everyday Glory. What's the last song on? Um, Roll the bones. Is that oh, uh you bet your reactionary? Life? Yes, thank yeah, you. You, you. bet, you bet your, your life. life. Yeah, they wouldn't really play those live. Um, what was the one yeah, on you counterparts? Bet your life. What's the last song in counterparts? I'm oh, drawing a blank here. Let's see. Well, we're gonna have to Google it. I'm gonna cheat. Yeah, cheat. My phone. 
Yeah. God, I, sh I should uh, know this. Yeah, we have like all these people sitting at home right now who are like, you know, they're yelling out the answer, like, get it, get out your shit together, people. How'd you guys are fans? Yeah. Can't remember everything, yeah. folks. And we're, and we're getting old. So, yeah. Uh, Everyday Glory is the last song on that. Oh, what did I? Yeah. Well, you said that. What was the last song on te Test for Echo? Good question. I, that's that's probably my least favorite uh. Rush album. <laughs> And I know I'm going to get some hate. I love the title it. track. Yeah, it's good. There's some good ones on there, but it's consistent. It's not driven, consistent. resist. I like driven a lot. Oh, I think driven is video. really good. I love the, the aggressive bass line. In fact, when Ged would play the sort of extended bass solo on that live, boo -doo 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 -doo. I cr oh. I cringe at uh, virtual carve away the stone. Yeah, carve away the stone. Carve away the stone. That's yeah. that's a good one. Yeah, virtuality is is. Oh, like, I could jump. I'm I could sorry. jump off a bridge. I love those guys. Yeah. I wouldn't jump off a bridge, but no, it's no, it's history's greatest tragedy. But yeah. I wouldn't jump off a yeah, bridge. I, 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 Not a great song. One yeah. playlist I I should have I should make final rush uh, last tracks of rush studio albums. Yeah, that's a good one. I always thought those are really interesting. Yeah. Or um, count well countdown. I know they played live a few times. I had yeah. some bootlegs back in the day. Yes, yes, sir. But yeah, they are, and then they did bring back um on Grace um. Between the wheels. Between the wheels, yeah. yeah. Right. Which I thought Alex's solo oh on God, that. Just, I love that. Oh, it was, yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's on my top, in my top five of albums. But yeah, Test for Echo, it's not, yeah, Grace is in my top five. <clears throat> Definitely. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, Test, Test for Echo is not, I mean, there's some great ones on there, but even Snakes and Arrows, I mean, I, I, I like it a lot. It's not my one of my faves, you know. I think Clockwork is much better uh, and much more consistent than uh, Snakes and Arrows. I always say that well, Snakes and Arrows is sort of their warm up album to Clock Clockwork Angels. You know, it's sort of their rehearsing to rehearse <laughs> in a lot of ways. But I, 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 I'm um, sort of working out the working out the uh, the ideas, and then boom, the, there's Clockwork. You know, so you might not even have Clockwork without Snakes in that vein. You know. Yeah, well, it's, it's it's interesting. I've been watching a lot of it. I'm a big Pink Floyd fan as well, but yeah, sometimes they'll say you would not have, you know, we, we would have not ever done Dark Side if we hadn't done, uh, oh gosh, what was the album before then? It wasn't Dubs. Uh, oh, met, Metal? Was it Obscured metal by Clouds or, or Metal? Metal, Obscure, Metal. Obscured by Clouds, yeah, I think so, it was. Or oh. um, how then they became big and then you got you got the wall. So, it, I right. mean, it, it's probably more pronounced with Floyd because Floyd was, was much bigger. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, what a contrast. Yeah, they both came from Prague roots, although um, Floyd, as you guys know, was much more psychedelic. But, I mean, yeah, yeah, the, you know, I mean to this day, I think, um, you know, Gilmore, and I was listening to a podcast, it's something like Rock Feuds, and they did the whole thing on Gilmore versus, um, I'm sorry, uh, Roger Waters versus the Floyd members. And then you think Rush, where, yeah, they had their disagreements, but, yeah. you know, generally guys who liked each other and, you know, were very polite, even when they would disagree and, so, um, but you know, guys, thanks for having me on. This was, well, uh, I could thank you, man. Hours and hours. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for coming on. And um, where mm -hmm. can folks find more about what you do? Where's your landing Phil page? Com. PhilSimon.com. There it is. There and anything in, okay. anything in store? Any, working on anything new right now? I'm debating doing another book, but uh, got to keep that under wraps for right now. I uh, hopefully will do as many books as Rush had albums. So I've got 11 down and seven more studio ones it was 18 right it's 19 19 19 oh we're counting feedback i guess we are i believe yeah. it's 19 Which, by yeah. the way what a version of the seeker i remember when that came out i, I was like sitting in a, in, a, in a consulting gig and i went out for lunch and bought the cd i think that was 2004 right yeah and I said, oh, that's kind of cool, right? And then the, you know, even the versions of Crossroads, some of the stuff they played on tour, I thought, you yeah, know, this is this is cool. I, I know like a it. lot of other bands have done the same thing, but uh, yeah. yeah, I thought the version of the Seeker was really neat. Just you know how you know Getty's voice had evolved, and I understand why people didn't like it early in the day, but I actually found it to be, you know, his voice changed. I'd argue for the better. Um, I mean, he, I think he took the shrieking as far as it can go, but I actually thought. You know, for for what Rush ultimately became, um, yeah, it worked well. You know, you didn't have to tolerate Getty's voice because they were good musicians. Uh, I, I, th I, I mean, it's it's an impossible counterfactual, right? And you've, I'm sure you guys have heard the Rush covers from 
uh, you know, Les Claypool or, you know, Dream Theater or some of the yeah. other bands. But, uh, you know, I, uh, it'd be interesting to see if, you know, if they would have been able to evolve as musicians if, if Getty's voice didn't evolve because I felt like, you know, it, it definitely suited the music and it, it you know, it was just the gestalt of their music. That, we often ask that same uh, question about Led Zeppelin, you know, yeah. if it, what would have happened to Zeppelin if we continued on and how they would have changed. I mean, Robert Plant's voice was, I think, on those principal moments albums and the, you know, the, the, the 80s stuff is so much different than their earlier Zeppelin stuff, you know, so. I like it better, to be honest with you. you? I like his yeah. later voice better than, I mean, yeah. he sounds great on the early stuff. Yeah. But it's, I like it's a little bit more like <clears throat> mature. I guess yeah, for lack definitely. of a better term. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it yeah. sounds good. That's why I, I yeah. think it was so sad that Zeppelin stopped because I would like to see where they had gone. You know, I think they were a ever changing uh, and developing band. Phil Simon, thank you for coming on to two guys talking rush, man. Yes. John, Dan, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Well, Dan, what did you think of, uh, of Phil Simon? He's an interesting guy. Uh, I try to work rush references into everything I do with other people, whether they want to hear it or not uh so i'm glad to meet someone else who also is on that kind of like feudal quest uh to work it into every single aspect of life no matter what so i'm i support what he is doing yeah i mean you know phil's a, a super professional guy i could yeah. tell he's very organized and yeah. he everything he does is intentional yeah and uh strategic i mean there's nothing sloppy about phil's work and his articulation of words and uh and everything there and it i i you know i would have to say he's he's a level he's a fan on another level in that yes. way you know? yeah totally um and sneak sneaking in rush references and all of his professional work i love it you know support he could be at a that. conference yeah. i know i support yeah. that just yeah. and, and it's almost like he's doing it's all self-serving because he's sort of playing yes. a joke you know he wants yeah. people to realize realize later like oh wait he was talking about rush in that reference or in uh in that uh, uh you know speaking engagement or in his book you know well he's also doing it like in the full knowledge that it is possible no one will get it but he's doing it anyway and yeah. i respect the hell out of that because he's do he's amusing himself first yeah. and that, yeah i really respect that it's not about like but will people like it if i do it right because that's just he's on this mission he's doing it and I respect that totally, and uh, his his sort of order of rush uh, significance, rush significant rush uh, interactions. Um, just remembering those little details that, in the big picture, may not have meant a lot to the greater rush universe, but to him, they meant a lot. And that, yeah. and to know that, to have that organized in a proper list. And uh, have it be so meaningful it just shows how much of a Rush fan he is. And right. we certainly appreciate his time on the show. Absolutely. Well, there it is, folks. Another magnificent episode of Two Guys Talking Rush. My name is John Kane. I am the delightful Dan Buckspan. And what can I say, folks? Rush rules. rules. Guys are talking, rush two, 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 two guys, two guys are talking, rush two, two guys are talking, rush two, two guys, two guys are talking, rush, 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 two guys. Two guys.